Hi, and welcome to K-Pod, a podcast about Korean Americans in arts and culture. I'm Katherine Hong, a writer and editor. And I'm Juliana Sohn, a photographer. Today, we're recording in a very exciting place, Juliana's apartment in the East Village, where we've invited writer and performer Karen Chi. Karen is just 23 years old, a 2017 graduate of Harvard, and a rising star on the New York comedy scene. She performs at places like UCB and Caveat, contributes humor to The New Yorker and McSweeney's, and this year landed the gig of her young lifetime, writing for the Golden Globe Awards, co-hosted by Sandra Oh. Her humor is smart and quirky and unafraid to take on issues of gender, race, and politics. At the same time, there's something distinctly sunny about it, too. If you hear just some of the titles of her humor pieces, they give you a pretty good sense of her style. For instance, times I've actually used math since high school, updated privacy policy for being my friend, Ivanka Trump's holiday decorations and gifts guide, and Asian woman can't tell if man has a fetish or sincerely loves Miyazaki films. Karen also has some big news. She just got hired as a writer for Late Night with Seth Meyers. Yay! Yay. (laughs) Thank you so much, Karen, for coming in today. Thank you so much for having me. So... Really, I think we should just start off with the Golden Globes because that was huge. How how did you get that gig? And tell us about it. Um, yeah, I got the gig, I guess, sort of in two different ways, which is one that I heard Sandra O oh was co-hosting with Andy Samberg, and I got incredibly excited because I'm a big fan of Sandra. And I have this photo, I mean, I have this t-shirt that says a quote by Sandra on it that says it's an honor just to be Asian. I love that. Yeah, yeah. it's like great. I yeah. love it so much. Um, and so I had a photo of it and I just posted it to Twitter being like, oh, like, please let me write for your globes. And that surprisingly got a lot of traction from a lot of people that I really admire. And there are lots of comedy writers and comedians who were just like, oh, like you should hire Karen. I don't know if that was actually helpful at all, but uh, it made me feel very nice. And then uh, there was a woman online named Priyanka Matu who saw that and then uh, helped me contact the people who were actually producing the Globes. And then my manager on the other end also reached out to the people who were producing and were just like, hey, this is Karen. She, uh, here are some of her samples, like your writing materials and stuff. And then I, yeah, I got the offer. So you went out to LA and you were in a room with how many writers? And I want to say like 16 writers altogether, maybe? There were a lot of us, yeah. And um, everyone worked for different television shows, and so it just felt like a cool mishmash of people. And how many Asians did you say were Uh, on the team for the Golden Globes? Two. Right. And you were one of them. I was, yeah. It was me and Bowen Yang, who writes for SNL. Right, so you were the only Korean there. And did you feel like you want to contribute something to represent Sandra O's oh background or some jokes she felt comfortable making? Yeah, I mean, I think I think very definitely yes, because, um, well, it felt so special that this was the first time an Asian person was hosting the awards, which means that because of her voice inherently, we have access to so many more jokes that we wouldn't have yes, before with definitely. just consistently white people hosting all the and time. And it's totally untapped. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I remember there was like a joke about like Asian moms and like no one else would have told that right. joke, you yeah. know? And like they panned to her actual Asian mom who is just the most adorable person in the world. And like, yeah, jokes about uh, people being in yellow face, just all these things the that Asian I think are blush. hysterical. Yeah. Right. And when I was watching it with my family, I thought to myself, who wrote these jokes? They're great. And yeah. they felt very kind of authentic. Yay, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to go back yeah, to sure. like your beginning and your roots because I think you have a really interesting um, family story. Yeah. Because you have a lot more support from your family. There's, yeah. it's like, you know, it feels um, kind of like less angst ridden <laughs> and there's a lot of, you know, mutual admiration. So can you talk about your family background? Sure. Um, so my parents were both born and raised in Korea and they moved here, I think in their late twenties and they met in the U S and married and then had me and my brother, my older brother, he is 29. Um, yeah, no, my parents are awesome. I could talk about them all day long. <laughs> um, they're the best. We grew up in a very Korean household, I think. Um, and that we always spoke Korean at home and I didn't learn this until many years later, but I guess I didn't speak English until I was three and like went to preschool. Um, so I grew up speaking Korean at home and we would celebrate, uh, you know, like we would have like and like Miyokog on birthdays and things like that. And just, it felt very much like we were, 
um, a culture that's very different from mainstream America. Um, yeah, no, but they're awesome. I think the nicest thing about my parents is that they really believe in my brother and me to do to like that, that we'll try our best at something and that we won't give up along the way. Um, and so we have pretty unconventional careers in that my brother's a sports videographer and I'm a comedy writer and they're both very supportive of both of those things. Uh, and I, I always noticed that to be kind of odd when I speak, especially with other children of Asian immigrants, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, because a question I get asked a lot by both white people and Asian people, although it feels like it's coming from a different place, um, is that, like, are your parents okay with you doing this job? Like, were they upset when you told them you wanted to go into comedy writing? But mine was completely the opposite what of that. What are your parents doing? I don't think you explained where you grew up. Like, oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I grew up in a suburb in the Bay Area in California. And what about your parents? My parents, my dad works for an airline company. He worked for Asian Airlines for a very long time. Uh, and my mom uh, used to work in therapy with, like, autistic children. And um, now she does ceramics and, like, <laughs> is having fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you say your parents weren't the traditional parents, right? Yeah. Um, with their traditional ideas about what you should do, you did go to Harvard. So tell us a I little did. bit about what kind of student you were, sure. what kind of academic pressure you might have had or not had. Uh, when I was little, I was very into school. Like I loved school. And I remember my parents always joke about this, how even in elementary school, I would refuse to like go away on vacation before it was actually time for vacation. Uh, and they were just like, where did this kid come from? Like, we're just trying to have fun and we want to leave early. And I think my brother and I were absolute opposites in that. Uh, my older brother, Daniel, is very, very smart, but he is not as into formal schooling, I guess, as I was. And so they had to sort of give him pressure of like, you got to do your homework, you have to show up in class, you have to, you know, don't flake. Um, and then I was the opposite, I think, of just being a complete square and probably deeply boring. And they were like, you have to have fun. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Self-motivated yeah. nerd. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, that's pretty much what I was like all the way through high school. And even when I got into comedy in high school, I think I approached it in a very academic way where I would sort of watch and study shows and study who wrote for those shows and figure out what other shows they worked for and like, I would take notes as I was watching TV and things like that. Oh, my gosh, that's incredible in high school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when you were an undergrad, I think I read that originally you thought you wanted to be a speechwriter and go into politics in some way? Yeah. Um, I was considering a few different things. I actually went to Harvard thinking I might be a math major um, and then was thinking of either doing math or government or something like English, I think, was something I considered. Um, but I really liked politics, and I was very involved with politics in my local government when I was growing up, and I love the way people craft their speeches, and I love the way people try and, like, deliver what they're trying to say to different groups of uh, citizens, I guess. I don't know. It's a... That feels like such an art form to me that everyone takes for granted unless you are in politics somehow, and so that felt very cool. Yeah. But then you started, what, um, submitting humor pieces to... Yeah, I realized my favorite and... thing about political speech writing were the jokes in the speeches. I was like, I love Obama's speeches because he's funny. Um, and I really liked political satire. And so just went with that instead. So what was the first humor piece you wrote or submitted? Um, oh, okay. So I think my sophomore year of college, I wrote, this is the first one I had submitted and gotten published was to college humor, which I think used to be a much bigger deal. I remember my friends and I were all very excited by it. Um, and it was called Eight Reasons to Feel Bad for White People. <laughs> and it was just like, like, think of the pressure you have when you have all that power. And <laughs> just like very silly satire on that. Yeah. That's pretty amazing that you're a sophomore in college and that you're being published. I don't think that I would have even thought to submit anything when I was in college. Yeah, I think I sort of it probably came from a place of foolishness, or just in terms of not realizing that there were any boundaries and being like, might as well try this, and then it worked. Was that something that uh, your peers and classmates were also doing? Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah. I think I just read these websites, and I was like, I feel like I could try this, and then I sent it in, and then it worked. Um yeah, I got very lucky. They were nice to publish. And me. then you got an internship, right? You got some TV internships. Yeah, I got. Uh, I worked for the Late Show with Stephen Colbert and Full Frontal with Samantha V for a summer. 
Those are two pretty like outstanding yeah. pieces on your resume while you're still in school. They were truly dreamy internships. Yeah, it was very, very fun. And it was the first time I'd ever gotten to see what it was like working for a TV show because I had only seen them and so I only knew what was on screen. But then to see just the hundreds of people behind them who are, you know, designing and editing and writing and, you know, people who work reception and all these jobs that were necessary. It was very, very And close. you got some on-camera time I on did, Colbert, very briefly. correct? Yeah, I did. Tell yeah. us what happened. Um, oh, I'm a bit embarrassed talking about it because it feels like so long ago now. Um, but, yeah, I... In college, I was part of an improv group, and we would have a comedian come every year, uh, one of whom was Keegan-Michael Key, and then he was on Colbert, and he's just, like, the nicest man alive. And I think mentioned that he had done a show with me, uh, and, yeah, they had me on the show very briefly. So one of the things that um, I think uh, we were so curious and really excited to have you on is that you are so young, and to hear that you've only graduated from college just, like, a year and a half ago, it's pretty incredible the traction that you've had and the experiences that you've had and what you've done with your time. And I think for anyone who's really interested in, like, how do you become a comedian? You know, how do you do these things? Um, Because it's not a a clear-cut career path. For sure, yeah. So it's really interesting to hear that you were working at it and you were doing things that were proactive while you were in school yeah. so that you had all this experience under your belt so that once you graduated, what happened once you graduated? Did you get a job offer straight away? No, or? no, not at all. Um, I actually think one of the best pieces of advice I got my freshman year of college was one of our advisors, I guess, told us to, she said, instead of trying to build a resume towards something, just do what you really like and what you really enjoy, then naturally your resume will be building towards something you want to do in the future. Um, and that felt like a very good and organic way of approaching my the way I spend my time. So in college, I did a lot of comedy because I was like, oh, I like this so much and I like doing sketches and I like doing improv and I liked writing. Uh, so then inevitably when I graduated from college, I just happened to have a resume full of these things. Um, I did not get a job offer right away. <laughs> I got a lot of job rejections, I think is the best way to put it. I did like a uh, maybe like a six week long acting program, I think immediately after graduating mainly because I'm very bad at acting and it is something that really terrifies me. And I wanted to do something that would just completely scare me immediately after graduating so that I would feel comfortable doing whatever. Um, Yeah, so I did that and then afterwards went home and lived with my parents for a couple months. And then I did this writing residency in Vermont where I tried to just... The writing residency, thankfully, was fully funded, which meant I had the peace of mind to just try a lot of things, even if I were bad at them. Where was um, the residency? It's called the Vermont Studio Center. It was in Johnson, Vermont, which is a really lovely place, but man, it does not have any Asian people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of these residencies do not. Uh, yeah, no, I think you're right. Uh, there was me and there was one other girl, one other woman, and people mixed us up constantly. Oh <laughs> and I was, like, Are you, I was like, I can keep 25 white people straight in my head, and you can't keep me and this one other person separate? And she, we don't look similar at all. She had much shorter hair and wore glasses. And like, yeah, but you get it. You get it. <laughs> uh, so what were some day-to-day things that you did as an intern on Colbert and for Samantha B? Um, I mean, I feel like interns do the least glamorous of jobs. Uh, they have, were very different internships to me, I think. Full frontal. I ran to get, I bought milk like once a week, uh, which was truly very hard for me because I have no arm strength. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I had to lug milk. Uh, what and was then the milk for? I have for people to drink. <laughs> Coffee. They went through Coffee. a lot of yeah. milk. I'm trying to think of what else we did. We watched a lot of other late night shows and then wrote down all their jokes because Full Frontal is a weekly show and then there are lots of nightly shows. And so I think they just wanted to make sure they weren't covering the same topics or saying the same jokes. So that was actually really, really helpful because that meant every day I would go in and watch four different shows and then realize how each host had a very distinct voice and a distinct perspective on things and uh, certain subjects that they would discuss and certain subjects they wouldn't even touch and things like that. Um, And then at Colbert, it it felt like they were really integrating their interns to being a crucial part of the show making process where I remember you like, I was a, I think I was a talent intern, which means I would make the gift baskets for the people who were guests. Mm, and then mm. once they got there, like escort them to their room and back. And What's in the gift basket? Uh, just like chocolate and shirts and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's not personalized for each star. I like don't think Kanye so. I really Kanye. don't remember. 
But yeah, they were very fun to do. The shows were very fun. Yeah. So um, I think from listening to you speak, yeah. it sounds really interesting because your whole, you know, this geeky, like intense academic, you know, personality that yeah. you had when you were in school, uh-huh. in a way, it's really translating into the way you write and the way you're, the way you analyze the skits that you um, listen to and uh, you're really thinking about it. Because I I feel like there are a lot of comedians out there and uh, a lot of their their jokes can be like, you know, about blowjobs or about things that uh, they know are almost like perennial favorites or whatnot. And it almost feels kind of lazy to me when as an audience member. Um, And so when... You know, I hear somebody and it is based on something that, like political humor or something (laughs) uh, biodiversity, the uh, um, monthly show at Caveat. I I thought that was great because there was a takeaway. It was based on something that was real, that was fact, and uh, you could take it and riff on it in some way. And I I love that, you know, you went to Harvard and uh, you came out of it because there's a school of thought like the Crimson Mm -hmm. and like a smart way of approaching humor. And uh, I think that's like a harder, more challenging, but ultimate, much more satisfying to listen to for some viewers. Oh, that's very nice of you. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'm as smart as you think I am, but um, I am a very, I think, I think I am a very serious person, which I suppose is kind of weird to be as a comedian. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think when I the things you're saying, like the topics that I write about is because I think about them seriously first Mm -hmm. and I'm Mm -hmm. very interested in those and I want to like spend a lot of time engaging with politics and like activism and race issues and gender issues and stuff. And of course those aren't inherently funny. Um, and so it feels like that first and then sort of twisting them and shining a light on them in various ways to make them more lighthearted and funny or to show some sort of weird uh, inconsistency within yes. those. Yeah. I mean, your um, your topic of choice, your skit for the um, biodiversity show, right. yeah. is it Darwin's Fox? Oh, I did, yes! Oh, yeah, that was the one I did for that show. I did cover Darwin's Fox. What a cool little animal. Yes. Yeah, that was so nice of you to come, by the way. Thank you. And, um, I mean, I thought it was hilarious that... You know, this animal has been discovered. It's given Darwin's name. Yeah. And uh, um, and it, it's so indicative of... You took this little animal, and it's so indicative of, like, what goes on in, uh, you know, oh, society 100%. and culture. Today, yeah. Where, you know, after all these years of, like, you know, having this fox that's named after Darwin, he discovered this animal, and then they realize that it's not actually even a fox. No, it's a wolf. <laughs> but here's the thing is they still call it Darwin's fox. And that's when you're just like, wow, those years of tradition just are so much stronger than this fact. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah, and to call it, I can't imagine finding an animal and then naming it after myself feels I know, insane. I know. That like level of entitlement over another creature is truly, uh, that's crazy. <laughs> um, so I want to hear a little bit about what comedians you like. Sure. Maybe yeah. in high school and in college. It sounds like you follow certain comedians really closely. Yeah. Um, oh, man. I mean, I like so many. I Or TV shows. Sure. Like the Office, right? Oh, yeah. I, of them. The Office was huge. That was the first comedy show I think I actually watched. I didn't know of any comedy TV shows until eighth grade, and that's when I started watching television. Um, and I watched The Office, and I remember it just blew my mind because I didn't I had just never been exposed to anything like that before. I read that you didn't even watch TV growing up. You have to tell us about that. Okay, yeah. I mean, I I watched... not typical. Right, right. Well, I have very strict parents, um, and so we had no screen time except for... I think we had, like, a half hour on the weekends, and so I watched Arthur. And we also had very limited channels. We had, like, PBS and C-SPAN. So I watched PBS until I was of the age to watch (laughs) C-SPAN. And, um, yeah, that was pretty much it. (laughs) So in some ways, your parents were strict, right? They were very strict, I think. But they were very good at explaining why they had these rules. And I, oh man, this is truly me being a square, but when I was younger, I remember my parents were like, if you watch these shows, um, your attention span will get shorter. And they proved it to me. We like sat down and we watched Jeopardy and they had me take like tally every single time there was a cut on the screen, like every time the shot changed. And it was just an insane number of tallies. And they're like, see, that's what television is doing is they're shortening your attention span uh, and you get 
you get reliant on this and you get lazier and you're not able to focus. Uh, so if you watch a lot of TV, it is bad for your brain. I was like, that makes a lot of sense to me. That checks out to the point where I would be like eight or nine years old in the dentist waiting room. And if there was a TV playing, I would actively avoid oh looking at the television because oh right they were very convincing. Um, yeah. And now you're a television writer. I know. I know. They really messed up. <laughs> But it's very sweet. They're now thinking of like buying a TV for to watch this oh show that I'm writing for. And so God, you were watching time. The Office. Yeah, what else the Office. were you obsessed I, with? Did you watch SNL? I didn't really watch SNL, but I was really into The Daily Show, The Colbert Report, uh, Parks and Recreation. Um, I watched House. I got very into British comedy, and so I think because I had watched The Office and I realized it was based on a British office, and then a lot of those people cited influences from, like, Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie and David Mitchell and Robert Webb, and so I got very, very into British comedy and things like that. Yeah. And then, like, in college, were there certain things that you avidly watched or followed? Yeah, I think in college it went from a lot of TV to internet-based humor, and I followed a lot of funny Twitter accounts, and that was sort of mind-blowing to see how people would just update jokes constantly um, and be able to have some sort of a consistent persona on this website that lent themselves to having harder jokes. Um, so I got, I remember following like Megan Amram uh, and yeah, just a lot of really So is things. Twitter yeah. a, a really important tool for comedians, do you think? Uh, I don't know if it's necessary. For me, it is and has been. Um, it's connected me to a lot of comedians and also sort of works as a running resume of just constant joke posting. And so I think what, what I've heard is that when you're up for a job, for a comedy writing job, they look to see if you have a Twitter and then they scroll through and see if oh, you have funny I jokes see. and how often you post. So how so. often do you post? Um, at this point, too much. <laughs> um, like three, f- three, four times a day. Um, I... I first made a Twitter specifically to practice my joke writing, and I my goal was to post one joke that I thought was funny every single day, and then, yeah, uh, and now I post, yeah, three or four times it a day. It seems like a good way to stay in practice and mm-hmm. force yourself to spit mm-hmm. out the jokes you yeah. have to do working on a show or anything, right? Yeah, absolutely, and then to see the response um, and learn whether or not it lands with other people or if it's just funny in my mind. Yeah. So what is your Twitter handle if people want to follow you? Oh, it's my name. It's Karen Chi, but with an extra E at the end because some other Karen Chi took the first one. (laughs) And I saw, was it New York Magazine that posted you as a Twitter account? must follow? I saw something Um, very uh, complimentary. I think it was Time Out New York or Paste Magazine. One of the two recently did one on me. Yeah. You have a great Twitter account. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm very flattered. I know that there have, there's have, there been a lot of, I, I think, uh, an explosion of awareness and a lot of uh, Asian comedians on the yeah. scene. Um, I think when you were at Harvard, you were advocating for Asian comedians and put on a show once a year. Is that correct? Well, no, we didn't start a group or anything, but my friend Sierra Cato, who is a stand-up in L.A., she and I put on a show called The Other Comedy Show that was essentially kind of like what Decolonize Your Mind right now is in that it was an all POC lineup and we just wanted that to be the norm. We wanted it... I see. Yeah, we wanted Mm -hmm. everyone on stage to be a person of color um, and then hopefully have everyone in the audience be very excited to see those people and so have the people in the audience also be people of color, which I think is a lot more revolutionary than it sounds just because when I go to comedy shows now, it's just me or one other person who's not white and then the audience is almost entirely white always and to be in a room just full of people who are excited to see you and who will get your jokes without any extra explanation is so validating and so fun yeah for sure Um, I have a question so when's the last time you've been to Korea do you go I go there pretty often um because my dad works for an airline company we and Asiana is based in Korea so we get tickets to and from Korea which is very nice uh I was just there in November to hang out with my grandparents for a week. My grandparents retraced their path, a part of the path that they had taken during the Korean War when they uh, went from what is now North Korea to the south, and they had to go all the way down to Busan. Um, And I went with them to take this trip, and we went on a train, and it was incredibly moving and wonderful. And you speak fluent Korean. I do, yeah, yeah. That's pretty great. Yeah. Have you ever tried to tell a joke in Korean? Um, My... I actually, I don't know if I've intentionally done it. My family is incredibly funny. I think uh, my mom is very funny. My uncle is hilarious. My grandpa is like, very, it was very funny. Uh, so I grew up laughing at jokes in Korean a lot. But when I try to watch 
Korean comedy shows, I'm sort of like, I don't, I don't really get this. <laughs> so I would love to hear what it was like growing up in uh, the Bay Area. Yeah. And uh, you, it was a pretty diverse, mixed neighborhood or yeah. community. And then you came out east. Yeah. So what are your observations on the differences that you've noticed? That's a great question. I loved growing up in the Bay Area. I grew up in a town that um, I went back one day and looked at the demographics, and our town was 30% Asian, which is so much more than the state or national percentage of Asian people. And so I think um, the the nice thing about it is that I grew up thinking it was very normal to be part of an immigrant family. A lot of my friends' parents were from other countries, and everyone spoke a different language, and that was fine and not uh, ostracizing at all. Um the sad thing, I think, is that even though I grew up in what seems like the best possible place for a young Asian child to grow up, I wanted to be white for so long. And that was just an underlying assumption of, like, I hope I become white someday, which is really heartbreaking. Um, were there actresses when you were a kid that you wanted to be? Or were there other... Yeah, I you, don't... What was your idea of what you want to look like or who you want to... yeah. I don't know if I had a specific actress, but I remember um, I used to, I wrote a lot as a young child. I would write stories. And when I go back and read those stories, my main character is always a white girl with brown hair and like blue eyes. Uh, and I just thought, because in all the books I had read and the shows that you see or the movies or the things you talk about in class, it's like everyone is white. The protagonists are always white. And I was like, that's what you got to be to be the protagonist in the story. And I didn't even question it. I don't think I was sad about it. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a very, that's kind of heartbreaking to me because... It just means there are people in other places that are even whiter than where I grew up, probably feeling that much more so than I did. Um, the Bay Area was great. There were, I remember thinking that there were lots of other kinds of Asian people and there were very few Koreans, especially where I was. And so like my high school, I think was about 1400 people. And I think our class had about 400 and I think there were three Korean students. Oh my um, gosh. So for a place with 30% Asians, it feels like Within the Asian community, it felt like there were very few Koreans. Um, yeah, which was fine. And then I went to the East Coast and uh, <laughs> big old culture shock. Uh, yeah, Boston was a really odd place to go to college because it is, on one hand, a wonderful city and has so much history that I really admire and I am such a big fan of. But uh, I remember in college, I dated a man who was white for a while and we would go out in Boston to sort of get double takes of being in an interracial relationship, which I had never gotten before. And then I remember going back to the Bay Area and just noticing like, oh, everyone here is in an interracial relationship. Oh, which brings me to a question. So in yeah. several, several of your humor pieces, you have a persona where you have a husband named Tad. Oh, yes. Okay, so <laughs> who is Tad? Okay, okay. And um, <laughs> give us this, this story. Tad is named after my uh, historical crush she was Thaddeus Stevens. <laughs> Who's Thaddeus Stevens? Oh my God! So Thaddeus Stevens is an amazing guy. Who um, he he? Have you guys seen the movie Lincoln? Maybe this is the most yeah. pop culture reference. Thaddeus Stevens was Tommy Lee Jones, his character, where he was very uh, fighting for like racial equality, very <laughs> radical, very him. ahead of his time. Okay. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I was reading a biography about him, and I was like, this guy rocks. <laughs> oh my God! And um, Tad is <laughs> And Tad is a nickname for Thaddeus, and so I always pretend like I have a husband named Tad. <laughs> I love it. That's so funny. Um, so I'm curious about how you feel about going on stage. Are you super nervous? Are you calm? Do you have things that you do, a ritual to prepare? Uh, yeah, I used to be incredibly nervous, and I think the more frequently and consistently I perform, the less nervous I get, or at least the better I get with dealing with those nerves. Um, before it used to be really bad. It would be like I, the hour and a half or so leading up to a show, I would completely regret this choice in career. <laughs> uh, and just be like, man, I hate comedy. I don't want to do this. It's going to be awful. I'm going to be in so much pain. And then I would get up on stage and have so much fun. Um, and after it's be like, I love this. I'm going to do more shows. And then inevitably that would happen every single time. And then recently I did a string of about 10 nights in a row at a show every single night. And after that, it sort of felt more ingrained in me physically. Um, and so even if I do get scared, it feels normal and less, um, uh, it doesn't freeze me as much as it used to. Yeah. Well, I was just <laughs> listening to Tiffany Haddish's audiobook, which oh, I highly recommend. When she talks about coming up as a female comedian, especially, I guess, as a black female comedian, she was exposed to so much uh, pushback, a lot of really inappropriate 
behavior by male comics. It seemed like a, a world where she had to be super tough. Mm-hmm. Have you ever found yourself in the comedy world that you've experienced where you have to be on guard and kind of back in people's faces and they give you trouble? Um, I suppose a little bit. I think thankfully I'm probably uh, getting to stand on the shoulders of people like her who had to do that a bit more than I than I do. I just started doing stand-up about a year ago, so I'm fairly new to it. Um, but I do also sort of have this mentality of I just feel very tired of having, like, my whole life I've had to calibrate my sense of self to a very mainstream white sensibility to the point where I'm very good. I think all of us are probably incredibly good at relating to white people and their stories and willing to empathize with them. Um, And so when I'm on stage, I'm just sort of like, okay, my turn. (laughs) You listen to what I'm saying. (laughs) Uh, So I am a little bit, I try to be less apologetic about where I'm coming from, and I almost want to have as few explanatory steps as possible so that people who aren't um, people of color especially have to sort of put it on themselves to take the next step to understand where I'm coming from or try to empathize. Um, yeah, yeah. I love that. So you do you feel like your voice is becoming, like you're writing from your voice now? It's not this blue-eyed Brown yeah. Oh, thank God. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I think so. And I think a lot of that is a willingness to talk about certain subjects that I, I think before I had a fear of being pegged as like an Asian writer or an Asian comedian. And now I'm sort of unapologetically like, yeah, I am. <laughs> like, if you haven't noticed that you're being dumb. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's it. And I also think, um, a large part of it is being willing to accept that your audience is going to be different than the audience for like Jerry Seinfeld, right? Um, And I think a lot of comedians grew up idolizing Jerry Seinfeld and assumed that the types of jokes he was making and the number of people he got or the types of audience members he got wore the gold standard. And I love nothing more than going to a show and just seeing lots of Asian people in the audience and being like, yeah, (laughs) this is so nice. it's, It's interesting because from a writer's perspective, the person who's creating the work, um, it's great to hear that because I think being in the audience, mm-hmm. I, I don't think I realized that I needed to hear it. Oh, wow. You know? Yeah. And uh, the, the jokes that I hear Asian comics make, I think, oh my gosh, this is like uh, about me yes, and totally. my home and my parents yeah. and, you know, and it's... It just resonates on us such a different level. It feels a lot more intimate. Yeah. And so while I think Jerry Seinfeld is hilarious, I think all those, you know, uh, comedians that I really enjoyed uh, are really talented. I I feel like I didn't realize the void and that it's really important that people like you are out there. And I think you had put out something either on Twitter or Instagram where you said... um, if you're a person of color and you want to come see the show, let me know. Maybe I can get you in somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really yeah. important for me to see your faces out there. Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I think just as much as we want more comedians of color, we also want more people, like, hopefully feeling invited and welcome to be there and aware that their stories will hopefully be reflected back to them on stage. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think comedy I is such a weird... There's a very fine line in the mentality of like, cause I think a lot of comedians are very wary of being thought of as quote unquote important, um, or as too serious because it is boiled down. It's a very dumb thing to be doing, right? It's just cracking jokes. But, uh, also at the same time, I'm very aware of the fact that comedy is an art form and is part of our culture and our culture really informs how we think about other people and culture plays like a direct influence on our politics and the way people are treated and everything. And so the fact that a lot of Asian comedians are now getting to share their stories and be very genuine on stage, Mm -hmm. I think is part of this little domino effect of that affecting culture, changing culture, changing the way people perceive each other and hopefully making politics better and more warm. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I do think that we are in a, um, a period of transition for comedy because of the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it, it's reflected in how Jimmy Fallon was like the number one, you Mm -hmm. know, show. And uh, then, uh, it, he, you know, lost that spot. Steve Mm -hmm. Colbert is doing a lot better. Seth Meyers is doing a lot better because that sort of benign ha ha ness Mm -hmm. just isn't really relevant anymore. Yeah. So this, um, 
you know, something that actually means something is making a commentary on our current situation and our lives um, that is actually impactful yeah. um, and gets a rise out of, you know, Donald Trump, I think is a really interesting place for comedy right now because it's a, it's got a very powerful role. Yeah, I would actually say, though, that I think comedy in that case falls under the umbrella of all art right now, um, just in terms of the idea of someone being completely apolitical in their work right now feels like a very political stance mm -hmm. because it just means you're coming from such a place of privilege that this is not affecting you, that it isn't upsetting you, it's not something you feel you need to discuss. Um, and I would say that is probably true for all forms of art. That's such a big generalization, mm -hmm. I'm afraid of saying it. Uh, and I think comedy definitely falls under that too. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think sometimes it feels very important to laugh at things that are completely not having to do with politics just to get a sense of relief, you know, for a little bit, like a breath of fresh air. But yeah, I suppose if you do have an hour long show every night and you refuse to touch politics, yeah. it's sort of like, come on, who's your audience? <laughs> it's yeah. the people who are doing fine right now, which is a very specific race and gender of people. Yeah. yeah. What kind of advice would you have for a an Asian woman who is trying to enter the comedic field? I would say right now we're in a very lucky place where people are actively seeking new perspectives and voices. So I would say to not be deterred by the fact that there are very few perspectives that sound like theirs. Um, obviously, there are many more now than there were before, which is wonderful. But to realize that what makes them different from the majority is not going to hold them back, but hopefully going to propel them forward. Um, and that we are sort of at this uh, moment, I think, where the jokes that feel offensive and annoying and tired, like just tired and, you know, done so many times are sort of starting to get eliminated or at least are just expiring. Um, and yeah, it feels for me, I feel so, so grateful to be an Asian woman in comedy right now because Crazy Rich Asians like just came out, you know what I mean? Like to all the boys I've loved before just came out. And um, there are so many people who are even just like five years older than me and like not to mention 10, 20, 30 years older who had it so much harder and because they put in all that time and had to struggle a lot and face a lot of um, uh, backlash for trying to openly be their selves, mm -hmm. um, that people our age get to sort of ride that wave. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if you're an Asian woman who wants to do comedy, you absolutely should. <laughs> If you'd like to see Karen perform, she has a, a few monthly shows that you can check out. Yeah, um, I host a monthly show at Union Hall in Brooklyn called Decolonize Your Mind. I co-host it with my very good friend Larry Owens, who is super funny. Um, and we always have an all, uh, an all POC lineup. And yeah, it's a really fun time. Um, the other show is called Biodiversity Jam, and it's at Caveat. And that one is a bunch of comedians doing presentations on like animals or plants or other organisms and it's just a very silly good time <laughs> thank you karen for coming thank it was you. lovely speaking with you and uh, um would you like to tell everybody where they can follow you on instagram on uh, um whatever? sure yeah i have the same handle on both it's just karen chi with an extra e at the end for both twitter and instagram yeah Fantastic. thanks karen cool. thank, thank you. you so much K-Pod is a production of KoreanAmericanStory.org. Our producer is Kevin Park. Our editor is AJ Valente. And our executive producer is H.J. Lee. You can email us with comments and suggestions at kpod at KoreanAmericanStory.org. You can see my portraits of all our podcast guests at KoreanAmericanStory.org. You can follow me on Instagram at Juliana underscore Sohn. For news and updates on K-Pod, follow Korean American Story on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook.